good to see you. See some familiar faces. It's good to um, be back. And thank you, Pastor Jim, for reminding us of some of those good old days uh, when Skywalk Church first got started. And the small part that Leanna and I played is a delight to our souls. And we're so glad to be celebrating this anniversary with you. And I'll accept in advance any invitation to come uh, at the 10th anniversary um, or maybe even the 20th anniversary. I don't think I'll be able to make it to the 30th anniversary, but I'll be with you in spirit. <laughs> so <clears throat> while Pastor Jim was praying in Cantonese, what do you think I was doing? I'm in a spirit of prayer, and I'm trying to, and I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I wish I could understand the Cantonese language. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you gave me that gift to understand? And just then, I understood one word in Pastor Jim's prayer, and it was the word encouragement. Pastor Jim, do you not have a word in Cantonese that means encouragement? You do. But when you prayed, you used the English word encouragement. <laughs> this is important because I'm going to talk to you about encouragement today. And I'm sure, I hope you have a good word for it. So, we're going to talk about how to be a great church, and being a great church has nothing to do with, with numbers, with um, finances, with physical environment, worship, building, but it has everything to do with heart. It has everything to do with our spirit. It has everything to do with our devotion to the Lord and our acceptance of the mandate that he has given us. And so, we come to the example of the church at Antioch. This church was a great church. And from the old church of Antioch, we are going to learn how to be a great church today. Or, I mean, you're already a great church. How to be a greater church today. Our first lesson, to be a great church, we must accept our identity. The point here is to be a great church and to be healthy and happy followers of Jesus. And in order to better relate to the brokenness of this world and better relate to people and serve people and minister to people and handle all the ups and downs that life will bring us, we need to have a strong sense of identity, of who we are. This is foundational. It is crucial. Verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first. Let's go uh, ahead in the slides. There we are. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, the author of the book of Acts is Luke, who was a physician, but also a historian. And I, I come to this passage and I think, why did he include this here? It's an interesting bit of trivia, maybe. If you're ever in a Bible trivia contest, you, you know, you'll know this is where the disciples were called Christians first, in Antioch. But I think it's more important than just that. I think it has a deeper meaning for us because here we're talking about the identity of those early disciples and how they embraced their identity as Christians. So, Leanne and I host a Bible study at our home. Even though we're retired, you don't ever retire from serving the Lord. Amen? We host a Bible study every Wednesday evening, and we're going through the Gospel of Mark. And it's interesting that in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, Mark shares with us what the Lord Jesus needed in order to meet all the challenges of his ministry, all the, uh, the good and the bad, the good, the evil, all the ups and downs, all the angels and demons, all the challenges that he would face, what did the Lord need? 
the Lord Jesus needed a sense of identity. Listen to Mark chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Our Lord Jesus was going to have to deal with some exciting moments of ministry, some great successes when so many hordes and thousands of people were following him and his popularity rose. But then he was also going to have to deal with rejection from many of his own people. He was going to have to deal with betrayal from one of his closest friends. He was going to have to deal with physical torture and crucifixion. And what did the Lord Jesus need to deal with all these things in his life? He needed a sense of identity. Here we see three aspects of identity. God the Father says to Jesus, his son, you are my son. The first aspect of identity is a sense of belonging. To whom do we belong? God the Father said, My son, I want you to know, when all the things you're dealing with, you are mine. You belong to me. This is the gift of belonging. Whom I love, this is the gift of affection. God made us as human beings, and we all need the gift of affection to know that we are loved. No matter what we're going through, the Lord loves us. He cares for us. And then thirdly, the gift of affirmation. With you, I am well pleased. Now, we fast forward to the early church at Antioch. And what did they need to deal with the brokenness of the world around them and to minister in the name of Jesus? How would they handle the ups and downs of service and the joys and the sorrows of it? They needed a sense of identity. They needed to know who they were. And the same is true with us because we live in the same broken world. We're going to experience the same ups and downs, the same joys and sorrows, the same hurts and healings. And we need a sense of identity. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Here's something. The people at Antioch were kind of known for their ability to come up with nicknames for people. It was kind of a funny thing. So later when the emperor Julian visited, they nicknamed him the goat because he had just a little beard here that went straight down like like a billy goat. And when they saw the disciples of Jesus multiplying, they called them Christianos, is in the original language. Christianos. The Ianos on the back part of that name means belonging to. That suffix was used of slaves belonging to their masters of uh, people of a certain party like the Herodians belonging to the party of Herod. And so it indicated belonging to. They were called Christians, Christianos, because these people, the secular world said, they belong to Jesus. They belong to the one who's called the Christ. And we don't know if this was said in derision or in mock, or to make fun of them, or just as a a moniker for who they were. But the early church embraced this title and said, yes, that is who we are. We are people who belong to Jesus. Later in Acts, the Apostle Paul, having been arrested, he experienced so many ups and downs in his life and ministry, It appears before King Agrippa, and as part of his defense, he basically shares his faith and tries to convert the king. And this is what we read happens. Then Agrippa said to Paul, 
do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul, Christianos, there's the same word. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. The king says, you know what? I'm king. I belong to myself. I belong to, to Rome. You want me to belong to a person that my government has executed? You think you can convince me to become a Christianos? Someone who belongs, not to myself, but to someone else? And Paul said, yeah, that's right. So far, the term Christian has been only used of secular people in describing who followers of Jesus were. But the, last, the third and last time the word is used in the New Testament, it's found in the writings of the Apostle Peter. And he says this, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Do you bear the name of Christian? Do you belong to Jesus? When you think, how do I identify myself? Who am I in this crazy world? I hope the first thing that comes to your mind is, I belong to Christ. So secular uh, psychologist and social um, sociologist they have this concept that was developed back in the early 1900s, but it's been reaffirmed through various psychological studies. And it was called the looking glass self. And this concept, the, the, the word looking glass is an ancient, old-fashioned way of, of saying mirror, a mirror. So who are you when you look in the mirror? What is your identity? How do we identify ourselves? And this concept says that our identity is formed largely by what the most significant people in our life think about us. I was leading a youth group once, and I had the kids go along. This was a long time ago. I had the kids go along and, and, and um, share something about themselves. Who are you? Tell us just one truth about yourself. And we got to this one kid and he said, hi, my name is uh, Seth. I think it was Seth Cobb. And he said, um, about myself, who am I? He says, I'm a slacker. Now that word slacker, you understand what it means. It, it's a reference, it's, it's kind of a derogatory reference to a lazy person. Okay. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, that's what my dad says I am. You see, that's the looking glass self. We identify ourselves in a large part on the basis of what the most significant people in our lives think of us. And this is why it's so important to be a part of a church family. This is why the scriptures say encourage each other. As long as it's called today, every day, encourage each other, build each other up in the faith. And here's the good news. When you become a follower of Jesus, then the Lord Jesus becomes the most important person in your life. And if the looking glass self is true, then that means what you think of yourself, what I think of myself, is based in large part of what the most important person, what the Lord Jesus thinks about me. And here's good news. He thinks you're terrific. He thinks you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He thinks that you're weak. He thinks you have some sins you're struggling with, some bad habits, maybe some addictions. You have some weaknesses. You have some doubts. And he says, I love you just the same. I love you with an everlasting love. This is who we are. We belong to the Lord. I love this praise song by Casting Crowns. Maybe you've heard it or sung it. Um, a really good song. I am a flower quickly fading. 
here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. First mark of a great church, we accept our identity. We belong to Jesus. Second mark, to be a great church, we must stay focused on our mission. So at Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Why Antioch? Antioch was a great church. Antioch started as a little mission church, and soon they became a mission-sending church. In fact, Antioch was called the cradle of Christianity. In verse 19 we read, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed. You might remember Stephen was the first Christian martyr. He was stoned to death. And the men took off their cloaks so they could better throw stones at him. And who guarded and held the the coats? Saul of Tarsus, who had become the Apostle Paul. And he was giving, the Bible says, full approval to what was going on. After Stephen was martyred, the church was persecuted. And so the early believers got out of there. They were refugees. They had to flee. Some went as far as Phoenicia. Uh, Phoenicia is modern-day Libya. Uh, No, not Libya. Lebanon. Modern-day Lebanon. So this is to the north of Israel. Cyprus, which is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, so that some got on boats and got out of there. And Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews, Antioch was 450 miles north of Jerusalem. It was the capital of the province of Syria. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Rome was first, Alexandria in Egypt was second, And third was Antioch. It had a population of 500,000 people, which is 10 times the population of Jerusalem. Now, Antioch, scholars say, had 18 different ethnic groups living in the city. And like all ancient cities, Antioch had a wall around the outside to protect them from enemies. But get this, one archaeologist points out that there were internal walls separating different ethnic groups from one another. Can you imagine that? Verse 19 says, The early believers initially spread the gospel only among Jewish people. Now listen to what happens next, verses 20 and 21. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, in the gospel, in the book of Acts, Acts chronicles the spread of Christianity from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. That's the goal. And here we see a significant difference. It says, for the first time, unnamed followers of Jesus. These are not apostles. These are not pillars of the church. These are people, some of them, they're not named. They're they're like you and me, people like us. Not famous people. Some of them began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. This is a first. Now earlier, Cornelius, who was a Greek person, had the gospel preached to him, but he was a God-fearing Greek. The Jewish people called uh, non-Jewish people God-fearers if they worship the God of Israel. But these are not God-fearers. These are Greek people, Gentile people, who worshiped idols. And for the first time, the gospel is coming to them. And it happened at Antioch. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. This is what happens when people like you and me, not famous people, not big 
evangelists or famous apostles or anything, when we indiscriminately share what the Lord has done in our life, this is what happens. And you remember... Um, You remember those walls that were built to keep people out apart from one another? Now they're climbing over those walls to worship one another. So it says this in verse 13, uh, 13 chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. So here, five leaders of the church at Antioch are named, and they're from three different continents and three or four different ethnic backgrounds. And get this, later in that chapter, the, the church at Antioch sends Barnabas and Paul out as missionaries. They started as a mission church. They became a mission-sending church. So here's the second characteristic of a great church. A great church welcomes everybody. Welcomes everybody. A great church sends people out. And so after this service is over, we will be sent out to our worlds to shine with the light of Jesus, to be his representative in the world. To be a great church, we must accept our identity. We must focus on our mission. And then thirdly, to be a great church, we must act with compassion. So in our passage, uh, a prophet named Agabus came to and from Jerusalem to Antioch. This is starting in verse 27. That will be on the next slide. Yeah. Act with compassion. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, in the Old Testament, there were true and false prophets, but the true prophets of the Lord said, Thus saith the Lord, and they spoke with great authority. In the New Testament, the prophets are slightly different. We're told, let the prophets speak, and then let the church decide for themselves if they're speaking the truth. So Agabus comes down. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread through the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. Now here's something interesting. Josephus was an early historian. And he tells us that the famine was especially hard in Rome, Greek, and Judea. Somehow, Agabus must have prophesied this or the church discerned it because the disciples, a.k.a. Christianos, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea, where the famine would be hit most hard. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Here's another reason why Antioch was a great church. They were a caring, giving church. They were a generous church. When the news that a famine would soon be coming upon the land, and they discerned it would hit hardest in Judea, their first response was not to start hoarding things for themselves, but to take up a collection to bless the church in Judea. The scripture tells us, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, in Christ God forgave you. The Lord calls us to be a compassionate church. So I was watching this nature show on TV. There's some great nature shows, especially Nat Geo Wild's Big Cat Week. But anyway, there was this nature show, and it showed a mother duck and ten ducklings following behind her. And they're swimming, like, and all the ducks, little ducklings, faithfully follow their mother. And then the mother jumps up on a ledge. And the first little duckling j 
jumps up but doesn't make it and falls back in the water and tries harder and makes it. The next eight ducklings also make it. But the tenth one keeps trying and doesn't make it. And it's squawking and flapping. It hardly had wings, you know, they're little ducking. Flapping, squawking, and it doesn't make it. What does the mother duck do? She goes on her way with nine ducklings now, not ten. And the narrator of the show says this. The mother will abandon that duckling because it's probably too weak to survive. The narrator then says, that sounds cruel, but that's the way nature is. A lot of our countrymen, our fellow Americans, a lot of people in the world today, especially in America and Western Europe, embrace a philosophy or a worldview called naturalism. This worldview says that nature is all there is. There is no God in heaven. You have no soul, so there is no real good or evil. There's no real right or wrong. There's no real meaning and purpose to life. It's just nature. It's just what happens. And there, so in this worldview, there's ultimately no hope for the future and no reason to act with compassion if it costs you something, because it's survival of the fittest. The Bible gives us another worldview. The biblical worldview says nature is not all there is. By the way, in the Old Testament, there's no word for nature. The only word they use is creation. Creation. The Bible says there is a God who created you. You have a soul, and there is an eternity, and there is such a thing as good and evil, and you can have meaning and purpose in your life, and God wants us to act with compassion because every person God created is worthy of our love and our, our giving, and God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, even love your enemies. Can't, we have a reason to act with compassion. And so the illustration is given in the Bible. Jesus is the good shepherd. He has a hundred sheep. What happens if he loses one? Does he say, oh well, that one was too weak to make it anyway. That one probably wouldn't have made it. It's survival of the fittest. Too bad, so sad, maybe it's good riddance. No. He leaves the 99 and goes and finds that one weak sheep, puts it on his shoulders, and carries it home. That's how the Lord treats us, and that's how we are to treat each other. God wants us to be a compassionate church. So we come to our last lesson. Just to quickly review, to be a great church, nothing to do with the building we meet or the how many we are. It has everything to do with our heart, our devotion, our commitment. To be a great church, we must accept our identity and know that we belong to the Lord. He loves us. Then secondly, we must focus on our mission. We're called to shine in this dark world with the light of Jesus. Then we're to act with compassion because in this broken world, so many need it. And then lastly, to be a great church, we must remain true to the Lord. Remain true to the Lord. This is verses 22 and 23. News of this reached the church of, in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now Barnabas is one of the great heroes of the faith. Uh, he was born and given the name Joseph. 
but his church family called him Barnabas. The word bar means son of. Um, a Hebrew young man goes through a bar mitzvah, which, in which he becomes a son of the commandment. Mitzvah means commandment. And so Barnabas means son of encouragement because this is what he did. He encouraged others. He would say, what a great job you did leading worship today. Thank you. God has gifted you, and you're using that gift to serve him. Thank you. That's the kind of guy Barnabas was. Thank you. Whoever played, who played the keyboard? Where's that guy? He, he stepped out. Anyway, good job. Thank you. Thank you for the way you serve each and every one of you. This is what Barnabas would do. And verse 23, then, is a play on his name. When he, Barnabas, arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all. He encouraged them. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, did what he does. He encouraged, what did he encourage them to do? To remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. A lot of people in today's world, and I say this with great sadness, are losing their faith in Jesus. Right now I'm in a, we call it a trialogue, which is basically an email exchange dialogue with three people. And the three of us are three old men now. And we, um, we all served the Lord together when we were in college at InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And we were leaders there. We had uh, uh, nearly 300 kids in our IV group, InterVarsity group. And we were leaders. <clears throat> and one of them uh, was one of my roommates in college. And we went to seminary together. We felt the same tug of the Lord on our hearts to further our studies. Then we became pastors. And we served in different churches, but we did what were called pulpit exchanges, right? Where I'd go preach at his church, he'd come and preach at my church. And, <clears throat> and when Leanna and I felt the call of God to be missionaries in Africa, my friend came and visited us to encourage us. Then he got his uh, doctorate in religious studies and became a religious studies professor. But now, sadly, he has left the faith. He um, calls himself a secular humanist. Instead of going to church on Sunday mornings, he goes to the bookstore and reads the newspapers. It's profoundly sad. Leanna and I have a niece who also was reared in the church. She went to seminary, but now she's an atheist. And she wrote a book called How to Leave the Church. <clears throat> it's heartbreaking. A recent study by the Pew Foundation said this. In the early 1900s, about 90% of Americans identified as Christians. By 2021, about 63% of Americans identified, said, I belong to Christ, identified as Christians. If those rates continue, less than 50% of Americans would identify as Christian by the year 2070. But get this, the third guy in our trialogue, remember there's three of us, he's the smartest of us. He was a philosophy professor. Philosophy professors tend to be brilliant. He left the faith for seven years, but then he came back. And this is why we don't give up on people who leave the faith, because the last chapter hasn't been written yet. God isn't finished with them yet. We still shine with the light of Jesus indiscriminately. So in the face of so many people leaving the Christian faith, the Lord's word to us is very clear this morning. Hang on to your faith in Jesus. Encourage each other. 
to remain true to the Lord to the very end. So I close with this. Michael Gerson was a presidential speechwriter, very brilliant guy. He's a man of faith. And he also suffered from clinical depression, which is a serious disease. He was um, sometimes hospitalized for his depression. On top of that, in 2022, he died of kidney cancer at the young age of 58. Shortly before he died, and I'm happy to report that he remained true to the Lord all his life, he preached a sermon at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. If you ever get a chance to visit our nation's capital, please visit the National Cathedral. It is a beautiful place built to honor the Lord. He preached a sermon there, and in his sermon he gave a personal testimony about dealing with depression in his life and dealing with his cancer diagnosis, which was terminal. And this is how he closed that message. He said, at the end of all our striving and longing, we will find not a force, but a face. The Lord's promise to us is this. When our strength fails, there is perseverance. When our perseverance fails, there is hope. When our hope fails, there is love. And love never fails. Hang on to the love of Jesus. Let's pray. God, our Father, thank you so much for the encouragement you have for us this day. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your amazing grace, which exceeds everything we've dared to hope or dream or believe about ourselves. And Lord, I pray over Skywalk Bible Church. I thank you, Lord, for their love of your word. I thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness to you. And I pray, Lord, that they will continue to be a great church, and I pray that, that their future is, will be greater than their past, that for this church family, the best is yet to be. I pray, O oh God, that they would shine with your grace and truth, that they would know that they belong to you. They would stay focused on their mission. They would act with compassion, and Lord, I encourage them to stay true to you for all their lives. We thank you, God, for this worship together in the name of Jesus. Amen.